So we're going to talk about worship tonight. Um, I've had several comments. People go, I thought they were kidding. Uh, <laughs> I thought he was too when he called me. But um, I do speak. Uh, I don't know if I preach or not, but uh, I know I love the Lord with all my heart. And the greatest thing about the Lord is the relationship that I'm able to have with him. And I want to talk about worship and relationship. You know, worship <clears throat> is not music. That is just a tool that we use to get in the presence of the Lord. But that's not really worship. That's just a celebration time, praise a celebration time when we come into his house and we thank him for all the things that he's done. And if he's done nothing, we thank him anyway. We just praise him because he is God. We don't really have to have a reason. He's not a Santa Claus. So you don't praise him because he's given you gifts or things. You praise him because he is an awesome, awesome God. I want to start in Genesis. Uh, I I don't want to preach my first sermon to you from Genesis to Revelation, but we may do that tonight. <clears throat> and it's at uh, chapter 2, verse 5. It says, At the time God made earth and heaven, before the grasses or shrubs, by the way, I am reading from the message, so uh, if you're looking at your King James, it's probably not going to match up exactly. But uh, I like the message. I like, I like it because it's poetic. And uh, sometimes when I read in the King James and I really just don't understand it, I can kind of look there, and, and it sometimes helps me. But at the, at, the, uh, at the time God made heaven and earth, before the grasses and shrubs were sprouted from the ground, God hadn't yet sent the rain, nor was there anyone around to work the ground. The whole world was watered by underground springs. God formed man out of the dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils and breathed life into him. Man came alive, a living soul. So, you know, we have, in the last few months, I, I, when I read that passage, I began to think about why did God create man? I mean, why in the world? You know the movies that, or the videos we've seen, how great is our God, and it talks about his vastness, and it shows us the heavens and the earths that he's, the earth that he's created, and they showed us all of the galaxies and everything, and how wonderful and magnificent they are. And then the then he brought to the point how small and insignificant that we are. I mean, you can fit in in the scheme of things, you can fit millions of us on a pinhead. So why would God do that? He's created all these great things. Why then would he? take the trouble. I mean, if it were me, if I were God, I would uh, just enjoy all the galaxies and the heavens, and I wouldn't have made us in all those problems. But uh, somehow, God decided, I need to make man. And I think that the scripture talks to us about we are made in his likeness. We are like God. And I think that people make God way, way too hard. We, we think of, you know, we have, I was watching a movie or a program last night. Kathy was watching it and showed it to me. They were talking about the dark ages and the light and all the superstition that come from that. And uh, people seem to make God some big spooky spiritual thing. But the one thing, the first thing that set me free was when I found out that God was not up there with a big club waiting for me to mess up so he could whack me. And you know, I we were raised up like that. I mean, I, I remember going home from church almost afraid because I, I didn't want to do anything wrong. I didn't want God to strike me dead or something. You know, I wanted to know him. But I really didn't know how to know him. I um, was in search. I, I had even really been call, already called to the ministry. When I got called to the ministry, I thought that was the biggest mistake ever because I thought that I was supposed to be a preacher. 
And um, I mean, when you got called to ministry back then, that was what you did. You became a preacher. And so my grandfather was a pastor, and I got some of his sermon books, and I looked at them, and I put me together some messages, and I got me some times to go preach, and and I thought, oh my Lord, one of us has made a bad mistake here, because it was evident I was not a preacher. And uh, so people said, well, music is your gift. Maybe you should look at music. Well, I mean, back then we were just song, they were song directors. My dad was a song director. He just volunteered at the church, and and that, that's what you was, a song leader. And so I, I thought, well, okay, and I began to get involved in it. And I began to to study my music and, and learn, try to study to show myself approved. And God began to open up doors, and I began to then learn about worship. I think one of the things, and, and I'm just kind of setting this up, I think one of the things that made me realize what my real purpose in life was was when I began to study voice and take vocal training and I began to realize they began to teach me how the mouth was formed and how our lungs and our diaphragm work and how air flowed over vocal cords and how that we had soft tissue in our mouths and we have a tongue that is soft and can move around and cause us to articulate and, and they talked about the roof of our mouth, how the mouth is formed. We have this one bone thing, hard thing. It runs back through the middle. And then it's concave, or it, it kind of domes out. And I began to think about that because I've been very fortunate in my life. I mean, at about eight, age 12, I started being able to work in recording studios. And every time I was in a recording studio that had a tuned room, there was a big beam that run down it. And there were things that it, it looked like a ma- the inside of a mouth when, when you go into those rooms. And I began to realize God formed me to praise him and to give worship to him. That doesn't mean singing. That means just, as Ace said yesterday, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If you can sing, that's wonderful. If you can't sing, that's wonderful. Praise Him anyway. Make a joyful noise. God has given you gifts. God has given me gifts. When I, when I think about God and I realize that I am created in His image and I want to know what God's like, I go take a look in the mirror. Because He made me in His likeness. Now, I probably don't have all the attributes of God, but I have some of them. I look around, and I see that there are prettier versions of God than me. I look around, and I see there are smarter versions. And I see some that aren't quite where I am. And so if you ask me what, what is about you is like God, I would say, well, we serve a big God. I'm big. Um, people that know me and are, are, that I love tell me that I have an unbelievable capacity to love people. So I love people. That's like God. And so there there are just lots of things. God likes music. I like music. And and so just so you know, Satan, Lucifer, was the first first very first worship leader. He was a beautiful being. He had pipes coming out of his chest and he could sing worship. He could, he just did wonderful things. But the thing that happened is he began to think he was greater than God. And nobody is greater than God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He thought he was too big. God cast him out of heaven. I think that's why my, part of my philosophy is why if you look at churches, most problems in churches, church splits, those kind of things, they come out of the music department. Now, why that is, is because Satan is jealous that we're holding his position, and he just causes havoc everywhere. So if you're going to be a worship leader, you better pray extra hard, because he's on your stuff, and you need to be ahead of him, 
And you need to be in touch with God, and you need to know that he is speaking to you. All right. We're going to talk about three aspects of worship. The intellect, the flesh, and the spirit. Now, we kind of saw the flesh here in the beginning, how it is. We have the ability, and that's a good thing. We have the ability to clap our hands. We have the ability to dance or to do the knee bob or jump up and down. We have the ability to sing physically. Uh, you know, we have that flesh aspect of worship. And then we have the spirit. And the spirit is that part that, we, that causes us to feel God. That is where God talks to us and we speak to him. I love what Brad said, and I remember being with Brother Watkins one time, and a person was asking him if he had ever seen an angel, and we were at a restaurant, and he was feeding himself, and they said, well, Pastor, surely you see angels, and he stopped, and he looked up, he says, my Lord, he says, that would scare me to death, you know, I, I don't see angels like Brad, now some of you may, and that's good, I'm not saying that you can't, I know there have been times that there have been appearances, but mostly, God speaks to me through my spirit man. And I talk to him in my spirit man. You know, the scripture talks about not confessing everything out. Don't speak it out so the devil can hear it. Talk to him in your spirit man. And then there's the intellect, the, the ability to think, the ability to know that what God has done for you, the ability to, to be able to put sense together and make sensible thoughts and think about God. All three of these things have to be in balance for us to really have a great relationship with God and for churches to be able to worship. Um, I have nothing against education, but some people get so smart that they think they know more than God. And they, they, they want to, because they're so intelligent, they want to show that aspect, and they get all out of balance, you know. They start putting rules in the church that say, you know, we, we don't want to pray for people here in the altars. That might be offensive. We're so smart. We don't, we, you know, God surely doesn't want that. And we begin to dictate what God thinks. Or we get all in the flesh, and all we do is run and flip and holler and that's what it's all about. If we don't have that service, if they didn't sing the right song to get me to run and to feeling good, brother, well, then we just weren't in the spirit. The spirit gets all out of whack. And when that happens, we get wildfire. Now, I'd rather have wildfire than no fire, but I would rather have a something that makes sense in worship. And then we have the spirit. People get all spooky, and, and they, you know, we know, and I thank God that I was raised in a church that we know about the Spirit of God. And we know how to give Him reverence. And we know how to do things in order. All those things are very important. God desires a relationship with you. No man, no person can worship for you. And no one else can have a relationship for you. I am the worship leader of this church, but I'm telling you, I am not responsible for your worship. I'm responsible for my worship. <laughs> and if my worship inspires you, that's wonderful. I hope that it does. I, I tell worship leaders when I speak at conferences all the time, I said, you are the worship leader. You need to be prayed up. You need to be ahead in worship of what's happening. Sometimes I think worship leaders get in trouble because we tend to have a creative mind, most of them that I've met, and I think that God speaks to me and tells me. I, I, I've had people say, well, you ought to share that. Some of the things I think God would share with me would scare you to death if I told you where I felt like God wanted us to go and worship. Now, we're going there. And we've been going there. We've been on a journey. When I first came in here, we were a red-back hymnal church. And there's nothing wrong with red-back hymnals. But we sing everything. You will hear anything from bluegrass to classical. 
in this church. It's, but it's not about the music. It's not about the style. Churches get all out of whack. They talk, I go to conferences and they have discussions on worship boards in their church. They're having worship boards, and I think that's ridiculous. I think that I ought to be able to sing something out of the Red Back Hymnal, and I ought to be able to sing a rock and roll song and have a guitar going nuts, and I ought to be able to sing a bluegrass song. It's not about any of that. It's about God and only God. It doesn't matter what I like. We sing songs that I hate. I don't like them. They don't minister to me, but they minister to somebody. They minister to somebody in this church. Every time we do a classical piece, I have people who come up through Catholic backgrounds and say, thank you for singing that song because that reached back into my childhood and it, and it touched something in me. So it's not, we, when we come in here, we come for one reason, and that's to worship God. I want to talk about Adam and Eve. Uh, God made the heavens and the earth. We were, we were there. And then he decides, I need to make man. And so he uh, makes Adam from the dirt, and he puts him on earth. I just I want to read that passage right there, uh, 16. It says, God commanded, or um, God, he made man, he made Adam, and he gave him a command. God commanded man, you can eat any from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge and the tree of good and evil. Don't eat them. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from it, from the tree, you're dead. Now, Adam was lived when when God created Adam. After he created him, he went and planted a garden, and it was the Garden of Eden, and he put him there. And there was the scripture we read earlier said there was no one to work the ground. So undoubtedly, one of Adam's abilities, one of the gifts that God gave him, was to be able to work the ground. And so it also, um, but in this tree, or in this garden, he gave him one commandment. There was one rule. Now, we put all kinds of rules and things on ourselves, but in the beginning of it, there was just one thing. Don't eat from that tree. Don't kill it. The minute you do it, you're dead. And so God would come into the garden, and he would, he would spend time with Adam. He would walk around the garden. Adam, do you know that Adam was naked? And he didn't know he was naked. He just walked around with God, and everything was fine. And then God said he needed to make a companion for him. So God created the animals. He formed all the animals. He took the animals to Adam, and he let Adam name the animals. How cool would that be? Sitting down with God. I, who knows what I would have named it. But if it was a cow... If Adam said it was a cow, it was a cow. And so they went through that whole process, and he made all the animals, and he still realized that there wasn't a suitable companion there for Adam. So he puts Adam into a deep sleep, and he takes a rib out, replaces it with flesh, and he makes him a woman. Now the problem begins. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so when Eve ate from the tree, Adam and Eve both were spending time with God. Everything was good. There was nothing between God and man. And I want you to remember in this, God never changes. He never does. Things change. Man changes. But God can never change. He is always the same. And I think the reason that he made man is because I think God There are angels and cherubs in heaven that do nothing but 24-7 say, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're magnificent. So he just wanted to be praised. He had that. So he had to make us for something else. I mean, we're, he lets us worship him, and we get to worship him, but God had to have a need for, re, for relationship with us. 
And so he created man, and then he created woman. And they were spending time, and there was nothing between them. And um, God uh, come down in the garden one day, and guess what had happened? Eve had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and Adam took a bite after her. You know, us men, those women do it, we follow. And uh, <laughs> I'm the same. But... Um, my dad used to say that it's not bad to be henpecked as long as you like the hen that's doing the pecking. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, God, um, he come into the garden that day and he started calling for Adam and Eve. Come out. Where are you at? And Adam and Eve were doing what? They were hiding. Why were they hiding? Because they had done the one thing that God asked them not to do. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Only me. You can't do anything to cause me to separate. No one can do it but me. And that's what they had done. And he called for them. And they wouldn't come out. And he kept calling. And finally they said, we can't come out, we're naked. And he says, how do you know you're naked? Because of sin us to have to cover up. If, if they had never eaten from that tree and no one else down the line had, we probably wouldn't even need these body scanners. You know, we'd just be great getting on the airplane and going like we are. But that's not happening now. <laughs> Excuse my sense of humor. <clears throat> so God never changes, but man changed. What did man change? He did something put a wedge between him and God. And so now there's something there. And if God never changes, then the scripture says, but his mercies are new every day. His mercies. So if I'm made in his likeness, and if I am like God, and if my examples, two of the best examples God gives us about him is that he's a father and he's a husband and talks about the bride but as a father I have to think back how I was now <clears throat> I have it's good to have um, Nate here tonight uh, and Suzanne there they don't get to come much they're on staff at another church now and I've got Philip and everybody knows Philip and how he is and those boys growing up drove me crazy and there were times that they did things that were just, they were just unacceptable to me. I mean, they were. There were certain things, I, I'm, I'm fun, I love to mess around, but when it comes to life and how you live life, there are things that are just not acceptable. And, of course, you know they're going to cross that line. And, and I love them, but I hate them. days maybe, but things happened that separated them from me. You know, I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want to see them. I, I, if I, I don't know if I had a dial a thing, but probably if they dialed me, I just didn't want to even answer if I knew it was them. But time passes and something happens and I miss them. And so I find a way, God found a way through sacrifice to make a way for Adam. God always makes a way. He doesn't change, but he makes a way. So he gave them sacrifice, and they were sacrificing the animals and everything. And you know, you couldn't just go out and get your whatever lamb, a black lamb, it couldn't work that way. It had to be a perfect lamb. It had to not be crippled. It had not to have any disease. It had not to have any problems. It was your very best thing, and you would bring it to a priest, and you would sacrifice that, and then you would be okay with God. The problem come in there where there just wasn't that much relationship 
You talk to the priest, and God talked to the priest, the priest talked to you. And that's just how it was. And you just bring your animals. I don't know how that worked. I'm, I'm not really, um, I don't know, every month or whatever, every Sunday you bring your lamb and get it killed. And it was gross. I mean, the whole worship thing was, there was blood everywhere. People were putting blood over their doors. All kinds of things to make atonement to God. And that was all because of the original sin. And because God wanted relationship with us, but man sinned and drove a wedge between God. And this went on forever. And then God decided that... Uh, I think he wanted more. And so what he did is he sent the supreme sacrifice, and we all know that was Jesus. Okay? Um, I want to look at the woman at the well, and this is John 4, 19 through 30, or starts in, in uh, 4, 19, where um, God comes to the woman at the well, and he tells her, you know, about the living water, and she'll never thirst again. And then she asked him, or he asked her about her husbands. And she says, well, I have no husband. And he tells her about all the men she had been with and that the man you're living with now, you're not even married to. And so the woman says to him, says, oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this. Our ancestors worshiped God at the mountain, but the Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship, Right? And he tells her, he says, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when Samaritans will worship the Father, neither here at the mountain nor at Jerusalem. You, wor you, will, you worship in the darkness and the Jews worship in light, but God is making a way of salvation. He says, The time is coming. It has yet come. He was it. He was standing right there talking to her. When what you are called... No matter where you go, or no matter where you go to worship, it won't matter, because there's getting ready to be an atonement made for man. It is who you are, the way you live, that that counts before God. Your worship must engage your spirit, and in the pursuit of truth, that's the kind of people the Father is looking out for. For those who are simply honestly themselves before him in their worship. Simply. We don't try to outsmart God. We come before him in truth. We take the false faces off. We don't try to hide like Adam and Eve tried to hide. You take your false face off and you worship uh, says their true selves in adoration in Romans 11:34 it says is anyone around is there anyone around who can explain God anyone smart enough to tell him what to do anyone who has done him such a huge favor that God has to ask his advice everything comes from him everything happens through him everything ends up in him always glory always praise and at the bottom of that, it says, yes, yes, yes. So there is nobody who is smart enough, nobody who is big enough, nobody can give God advice. We tend to, in nowadays, to kind of pump people up and elevate them. Now, I'm not talking about giving honor. We have a great pastor, and we just had a wonderful Pastor Appreciation Day. And that's all in order. But the pastor, like me, is not responsible for your worship. He is responsible for giving you the truth and to praying with you. But the problem is we want the pastor to do all the praying for us. We want him to do the work. And why do we do that? If you want him to do all the work, you probably don't have a really great relationship with the Lord. To be in His presence. God or men, we act.
Acts 14 and 8. There was a man in Lystra who couldn't walk. He sat crippled since the day of his birth. Paul, he heard Paul talking. Paul, looking in his eyes, saw that he was right for God's work. Paul told him, he said, get up on your feet. And the people around him heard Paul say, get up on your feet. And the man, he just jumped up. And it was just like he always was walking. He was able to walk. Well, everybody got all excited about that. And the priest and everything of that city, they began to get a group of people together to, per, to form a parade for Paul and for, Bar, uh, for um, Barnabas. They were both there together. And Paul and Barnabas, when they realize what's happening, they they start waving their arms. Says when in uh, chapter fourteen says when Barnabas and Paul finally realized what was going on, they stopped them, waving their arms. They interrupted the parade, calling out, "What do you think you are doing? We're not gods. We're just men like you, and we are here to bring you the message, to persuade you to abandon your silly god superstitions." and embrace God himself, the living God. We don't make, we don't make God, he makes us. He made all of us of one blood and his son and everything in him. We still are doing that. We feel like if we get in touch with the right televangelist or if we go to Pastor Ray's church, we go to Pastor Ray's church. Well, that's a great thing. They've got a good sound leader over there. They just, you know, so what? God does not want that kind of relationship with you. It's okay if you're excited about coming here. I love I love when Brad gets so excited about the church. I, I love Brad anyway. That, he's a special guy. I when he was a little bitty, I used to take him and Philip to basketball practice, and I had no idea, I didn't really know him that well, but it's just been a real blessing to me to see him, and I'm glad that he's excited about it, but God does not want a relationship, if he would have wanted Pastor Ray to have a relationship with you, or for you, he would have just let us keep sacrificing. We would have brought our lambs in here to Pastor Ray, and he would have sacrificed them for us, and he would have gone to God, and God would have said, well, Pastor Ray, they're doing pretty good, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then Pastor Ray would come back, and he would tell you about that. But God doesn't want that kind of relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to know you. It's not hard. It's not hard. All you've got to do is praise Him, worship Him. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you what God wants. I, I, I think I skipped that. Well, let me just put it in there. The, he wants us to live a life that glorifies Him. Praise and worship is when you get up in the morning and when you treat your wife good all day. And when you don't treat your wife good, you go to her and you say, baby, I'm sorry, and you apologize. It's about when you get up and you go to work, and you may not like what you're doing, but you don't grumble about it all day. You allow them to see God through you. If you've got the kind of relationship you should have with the Lord, you're, you're with Him, you're talking to Him, you're praising Him, and that comes through. That comes through. God wants a relationship with you. He has made extravagant efforts to have a relationship with you. He created heavens and earth and seas and animals and man so that we can look around and we can see how awesome he is. He did all that. But better yet, he wanted a relationship with you so bad that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that so who, whosoever liveth and believeth in Him will have everlasting life. We will have that relationship 
but it's an earthly relationship with your Father. When we come in to His presence, worship Him unabated. Praise Him and think. Use the intellect to think about all the wonderful things. If you're alive, God has done wonderful things. And I'm telling you, one click and your heart can stop and you'll die. Miss just a few breaths and you're dead. It's a miracle that we, that our body just works. Everything in it works. And it just keeps pumping and it keeps doing. And that's a miracle of God. So if He hasn't given you a million dollars this week, He has still blessed you. Because He is, remember, He is God. He is not Santa Claus. He, he gives us intelligence so that we can figure things out on our soul. So we can know. I don't have, God does not come down and tell me, for the most part, sometimes He speaks to me, but He does not come down and tell me everything to sing. I've had singers come to me and go, I can't sing today. God didn't tell me what to sing. Well, are you not smart enough to figure it out? Sing something about God. You know, if he hasn't specifically told you, God's a good subject to sing about. He gives me enough sense to know how to put things together and to know that, and he does that. Have confidence in God and have confidence in yourself. All God wants is for you to know him and to know that he cares. He really wants to know you. He wants to know you. What does God want? He wants to know you. What is God's will for your life? He wants to know you. What does he want you to do? What did he do? He created you. He gave you gifts. Look at your gifts. Look at your gifts if you want to know what to do for God. I don't understand why people who just, they love music. Music is their whole life. And they play instruments, they sing, but they can't figure out what God wants them to do. What gift did he give you? You can teach Sunday school, but you don't know what God wants you to do. You love young boys. You love to share and show them how to do things. You can build things. I, I just think it's awesome that David Anderson can build cabinets. You know, he built these beautiful cabinets. Lord have mercy, they would be so wrapped with jars. Philip, Philip blamed me one time for flunking a, a drafting class because he had to draft and build a little house, and it was all crooked. And Kathy said, baby, surely you could have done better. And he says, look, all these other guys' dads are plumbers and carpenters. All my dad can do is sing. You know, what's my gift? Dave makes cabinets to look beautiful in this sanctuary, and I sing to make it beautiful and because I love the Lord. God wants you. He wants you. That's all. He made Adam because he wanted to have relationship with him. And if we are made in his likeness, don't you like to have relationship? There's nothing that makes me feel better. The best minute of my day is when I wake up and I breathe him in and I smell coffee. And I walk in my kitchen and there stands my baby. And she has made me coffee. Now there's some mornings she doesn't do that. She tells me I'm warming up, which means I'm heating up my coffee. I love her the same. I want to be with her the same. She doesn't do it like I like it all the time, because if she did, I would have coffee every minute. But she's pretty close. But I, but I always make a way. You know, I always make a way for her to get back with me in unity. And that's what God does. That's what he's done through all the ages and what he wants to do now. Would you just stand? Lord, I pray that you would help us to worship you in better ways.
Father, we glorify you. And Lord, I love being the worship leader in a church where they know how to worship God. But Lord, I want us to worship you better. I want when people to come in the door where they're to feel your presence like they've never felt before. I pray that the day comes when we begin to sing and pray, do praise and worship, that that old-time conviction comes back. That's what's happening when we begin to worship the Lord and we see people come to these altars because God is touching their lives. The, the worship creates an atmosphere of praise that makes the spirit open and allows people... They come in here all week long. They have lived in hell all week long. And if they can come in here and if we can just confuse the spirit and make them see that there's a way, God has made a way. No, you may not have lived a a great life that week, but God still loves you. You don't have to be good enough to come to God. Isn't that great? I mean, you don't have to do anything. God wants relationship before he wants rules. And we get it all backwards. We think, I got to do this. I got to straighten my life up. And then God will accept me. No, he accepts you right now. Right this moment, he wants to speak to your heart. And right this moment, Give myself away. Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Give myself away. sing this again and I'll, I'll first would want anyone like that I'm not saying you're backslid you know I was saved and called to the ministry before I learned how to have relationship with the Lord I was trying to figure it out I got all offended years ago when somebody left the church and they said to me you are bound up in your if I'm going someplace where it's free. I wasn't the worship leader. They, and I, I was so offended by that. I thought, well, I've been raised up in the church of God all my life. I know how to worship the Lord. I found out I was bound up in my worship. They were right. I wanted to get all the religious things out of my life. I'm probably the least religious person you have ever met in your life. But I love the Lord with everything in me. Religion gets in the way. It got in the way. It got in the way when they were going to crucify Christ. The religious people, they were mad at him because he had healed on the Sabbath. I love Richard. Richard, the message, and I tell him this often. The message that he preached about my space, about getting out of the box. God is not in a box. God can do whatever he wants because he is God. He's always been able to, but we put him there. And we hold him there. No, we can't do that. That's not God. No, we can't do that. You know, somebody yesterday, when the 
gentleman wanted to sing blue suede shoes. That wasn't a godly thing to do. But it was something that he wanted to do. And I did something for him that he wanted to do. And then when we began to sing, he realized it. Right there he is. Right there we are. He realized that I wasn't judging him. And we began to sing gospel songs. And I watched his hand go up and praise the Lord. Come down. If you just want to have a better relationship with God, I'd like to.